Yes, sir. It is the Lonnie Hunter Variety Show. It is on and popping, ladies and gentlemen. I got my co-host in the room. Co-host, make some noise. Yeah. Today is a special edition of the show. And on today's show, what do we have, co-host? Special edition of Clues and Characters. All right, you did good. <laughs> Who else is on the show, bruh? Pastor Jamal Come on now. Welcome to the show. What's happening, Dad? How you feeling? This is my dad, y'all. No, it's not. <laughs> it's really not. He's just light-skinned like I am, so we just do it. You know what I'm saying? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the show. So glad you are here tonight. Let's give it up for Miss Seeley's Blues. Absolutely. It is our very first pop-up show. Normally, we are in the studio in Philadelphia, but I wanted to come out here and do something for Miss Seeley's Blues. It is a black-owned business that is doing great things in the South Jersey area, so we wanted to make sure we came out here and did just something you know, small, intimate, and make it big for them. So uh, Miss Seeley's Blues, how many know it's gonna be a success already because we're speaking? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. So the question is, how many people are in the audience right now? Make some noise if you're single. All right. Now some of y'all I know are single but didn't clap, so you single and mad about it. Right? You just upset about the whole situation. <laughs> But this is what I want to talk to. This, this, this whole first part, I want to talk to the singles because if you're dating, you go through some stuff. You know, it's not real easy to just walk out the house and walk up on Mr. Wright or walk up on Mrs. Wright because she just really is not standing there. All right? So I was watching TV, and this show was on. I know y'all watch it. How many of you watch Catfish? You've seen it. You've seen it. So my question is... Well, first of all, if you don't know what Catfish is, that is somebody who is pretending to be somebody else online, and then when you go meet them, it's somebody completely different, all right? So you could be thinking you're talking to a woman and go, and it's a man. You could be thinking you're talking to this, and the pictures are always great-looking people, and then they come out that door at the reveal, and it's like, bump, 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 <laughs> you know? But here's my question, and I cannot get my mind around this. Most of the people are talking about that they've been talking to these people for years. I've been with them for three years, and we've been talking, and uh, I'm, I just feel like I'm in love with them. So have you FaceTimed with them? No. Uh, every time I get ready to FaceTime, they tell me that something is wrong or something goes wrong or we want to meet up and they don't show up. I don't know about you, but it would take me all of five minutes. What? Do you understand what I'm saying? If I ask you to FaceTime me on a live kind of joint and you tell me you can't, that's the last time we talk. <laughs> I can't even help you. You understand me? There is something, though, that I saw the other day. The catfish called the person they were catfishing a catfish. So they turned to him and they said, well, you're the catfish, and walked behind this dude and they were like, what do you mean I'm a catfish? They took this dude's hair off. <laughs> what? Do it. Everybody, you could feel the room go, oh my God. Because now women aren't the only people wearing weed. Did you know that? There are barbers that can take a man's horseshoe baldness 
and put on waves. And then you cannot tell because until that happened, I didn't know that was fake hair on top of this dude's head. And when they ripped it off, it was like patches. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so I'm going to give you some, some situations. And all I want you to say is, you lying. All right? So try it. One, two, three. You lying. Now, if you text somebody and they take forever to text you back, and when they text you back, they say something like, I got a new phone and it's real hard to uh, navigate, so I missed your, I missed your text. You lying. Because it's one thing about cell phones that has not changed in 88 years, and that's the text service. All you do is text back. I don't know what's new about your phone that you can't text me back. You understand me? If somebody tells you, they text you back, and they say, I was knocked out when I got your text. You lying. You lying. You, you sleep with your phone next to your bed. You can hear it go off. How many of you will wake up when your phone go off? You know when somebody is lying. Now, if somebody says to you, I meant to call you back. You because if you meant to do it, you would have done it. huh? Now, all you got to do, now I'm going to give you this. Spend some time with your friends, somebody that you might be interested in. Just go somewhere with them for about three or four hours. Watch how close they are related to their phone. If you spend some time with somebody and they're always looking at their phone, or you go to the movies, they're always texting, the phone rings, they're always answering it. Everything is phone, phone, phone. Where's my phone? But when you text them and you're not with them, and three hours goes past, why you can't text me like how you was texting everybody else when we was together? You, yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, now the, the Bible says, and it's right, <laughs> I mean, who am I? Who am I, right? right? The Bible says, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing, right? But ladies, you got to be somewhere where you can be found. You can't be at home reciting that scripture on your couch because we ain't coming to your door. Because as soon as we knock on the door and be like, you, God say, you my wife. You lying. <laughs> you lying. Me. So get out, you know, be at places. It doesn't mean that you have to be running around looking for him, but let yourself be someplace where he can find you. Now, here's the key. <laughs> when he finds you, make sure you are the you that day that you're going to be in the next two weeks. You feel <laughs> You feel me? I was on Instagram, and this girl, <laughs> she was talking about this waist trainer, right? And she was, you know, snatch, boom. I was like, come on, waist, OK? And she started talking about the waist trainer because she wanted to sell it, right? So she started unbuttoning the waist trainer. Unbutton that last joint, poop, pow. What? <laughs> I said, you got to be more careful out here dating. You know what I'm saying? So if you are single and happy that you're single and you're waiting on him for whenever he comes, clap your hands. <laughs> we are going to have a great time tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad to be here with y'all. Now, I normally have a co-host, but tonight, y'all going to be my co-host. Can we do that? Yeah. yeah. We got a lot going on in tonight's show. Jamal Harrison, Brian is on the show. Clap your hands for Pastor Brian. Yeah. We're going to do clues and categories a little different tonight. So somebody's going to walk their way into a five-day, four-night stay in Cancun, Mexico. Yeah, y'all like free. Y'all like free. Also, one of the things that I'm so excited about this show is that it's a variety show, so we can do things that normally shows like this on gospel or faith-based stations don't do. As you know, most of the time when you say a gospel show, it's all about singing. Well, tonight, we're going to go into drama as it relates to the missionary and the industry and the ministry. There's so many people out here that are pushed back 
out of the church because the talent that they have is not really embraced or there's not a place for it in the church. So tonight, for those of you watching, wherever you are in the country, you're going to see exactly how ministry and your gift, whatever your gift is, can work together for the good of them that love the Lord. So for everybody in here that loves the Lord, clap your hands. Yes, sir. So stay close, keep it up, and we will be right back with more of the Lonnie Hunter Variety Show. Get it done, baby. All right. Y'all so good. I like y'all. Y'all laugh at stuff that I don't even think is funny. <laughs> right. Clap it up, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. Welcome back to the Lonnie Hunter Variety Show. You know how we do it, right? Clues and categories. Normally, it's Battle of the Sexes, but today we're doing it a little bit different. These contestants are on the road to Cancun. Let's find out who might be going for five days, four nights, courtesy of YouGospel.com. Contestant number one, what's your name? Nefessa. Nefessa. Where are you from, Nefessa? I am from Camden, New Jersey. I live in Lindenwald now. All right. All right. Nice work. Nice work. And your name? I'm Pat. Pat, I didn't hear you. Pat. All right. And Pat, what's your last name? Jackson. Pat Jackson is in the house. All right. So this is how it's going down. I'm going to ask you a question. And the one that knows the answer the quickest, shout out the answer. If you are the first one to answer, you take a step toward me. After 10 questions, if you are the closest one or whoever is the closest one to me is the one that I'm shipping off to Cancun. All right? Are either of you married? No. All right. All right. All right. Either of you have kids? No. <laughs> so y'all already know what this vacation is about to be like, right? <laughs> right. No kids, no, no, I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. All right. Are you ready? Ready. Here we go. When riding a horse, what do you sit on? Saddle. Saddle. Both of you take a step forward. Stay even. Don't be doing all this. <laughs> <laughs> what sport uses a ball and a goalie? Soccer. Soccer. Step one. Hockey is a puck. Field hockey is a ball. This hockey. <laughs> Dannon makes yogurt with fruit where? In the bottom. I ain't mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> she say, dog on it, I'm gonna hit you with this puck if I don't get this next thing. <laughs> <laughs> In court, which lawyer is charged with getting a guilty verdict? Prosecutor. Prosecutor. You take a step forward. <laughs> <laughs> what channel or network does this show come on? Impact Network. Step forward. <laughs> <laughs> I almost want to back up because they scaring me. They just straight scaring me right now. <laughs> All right, I know, right? Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, what branch did I leave out? Marines. Marines. One step forward. Hmm. The doctor that deals only with children is called a what? Pediatrician. I'm not even ready. <laughs> True or false? There are two sets of twins in the Bible. False. True. It is true. <laughs> They took a long time to. <laughs> and I had to think about that. Right. Made me feel like I'm about to be wrong. All right, this is the last question. If you get it, you tie it up and we go to a tiebreaker question. If you get it, you are on your way to Cancun. All right? What blocked the tomb of Jesus? A stone. Yeah! <laughs> She is going to Cancun, Mexico. 
five days, four nights stay at a five-star hotel. Congratulations, baby. Congratulations. Courtesy of YouGospel.com. I love it. Stay close to the Lonnie Hunter Variety Show. More to come. We'll be right back. Yes, sir. Come on, girl. Yeah. Nice work. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome back to the Lonnie Hunter Variety Show. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been doing things all season long that opens up doors. It opens up doors and opportunities for people who don't normally get the opportunity to be on such a platform. 86 million homes watch the Impact Television Network, and the kingdom is so big and so large and so diverse that we can do more than just sing. While we sing and we do it well, while we play and we do it well, there are so many other uh, legs to this umbrella called salvation, to this umbrella called kingdom. And we want to just kind of focus today on the drama aspect. And I got three people sitting next to me right now that are top of their game at what they do. Won't you show them some love? Corey Shelton, <laughs> Kara Shelton, and Joshua Worlds. When we, when we talk about uh, drama family in church, it was in the last, say, maybe 20 years, and I'm being generous, that the church was even open to somebody doing a skit in church. Um, what, have, what do you think has opened up since we've been able to see that? What has opened up for the minds of the people in the congregation as it relates to drama being able to connect? Carrie, you say what? I think that um, what I always say is that drama is a visual representation of the congregation. I think that it's a way of the congregation being able to see themselves in the church. What we do with drama in the church is show an issue, show a problem, and show Jesus in the problem. So it's a visual representation of our lives and Jesus working in our lives. And Corey, you mentioned something to, that was right along with her when we were talking off camera, and you talked about the way you connect to who God is and what he's done. And a lot of times you found yourself before drama not being able to connect to the word as it was being preached traditionally. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I realize that I'm not alone. Like, I... Not everybody can sit through a 10-minute sermon, a 30-minute sermon, a 60-minute sermon. Some people, like myself, I'll, I'll be uh, transparent, sometimes need to actually see <clears throat> some sort of tangible representation of what they're going through in their life and exactly how they got over. You know, sometimes we can get kind of lost in the, I don't want to say weeds, but the weeds of the you know, spiritual rhetoric a little bit that kind of comes from the pulpit. And I think drama kind of sort of simplifies that a lot more so that, you know, you can understand it. People like myself can understand it. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I appreciate it so much. When you talk about drama and kind of the openness that you get or the, the freedom that you get, uh, Josh, you have a style that is not normally seen in the choir stand. But drama opens that up for you and it does for all three of you because you get to become other people how does that how does that make church something that you really want to go to well i could recall a time where uh some friends from high school came out to the church and they saw one of our plays and to see me um and how i was dressed and the openness like you were just saying it made them kind of connect more and connect you know in a way where they may not have connect through song or like he said through the word but they was able to connect to God through what we were doing and displaying, so. Because a lot of times, you know, people don't walk down the street in choir robes. Right. So <laughs> when you come into a church and you see this facade, you know what I'm saying? And I say it all the time, a, a robe covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> but when you see that and you don't dress like that or you see the pulpit and the pastor and the assistant pastor and all of that, and they're suited up and all of that, the ushers have on what they have on, the deacons have on what they, they have on, but I am 19, just coming out of high school, I don't dress like that. So drama gives us an opportunity to see that there are other people who don't necessarily have to look like that, but can be saved. 
Have you ever been in an opportunity or in a situation where somebody came up to you and said, it's because of what you did that brought me closer to who God is? Yeah. What was that experience like? Um, absolutely. There's a skit that Corey and I um, have done many a time um, called Why Didn't You Tell Me? And it's about witnessing mm -hmm. to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, we play, well, cousins, <laughs> which we are in real life. Um, and I'm saved and I don't tell him about Christ and we get in a car accident and he goes to hell and I go to heaven. But I never told him about Christ. And every time you minister it, it never fails that somebody doesn't come to us. They, somebody always comes to us and tells us that that actually spurs them to tell somebody about Christ. And it's because of the representation and seeing that you never know when life will be cut short. You never know when you'll run out of time. So it's thinking to yourself, oh, I'll tell somebody tomorrow. Oh, I'll tell somebody next week. Oh, I don't know if I want to tell them now. You get the visual representation of tomorrow may be too late. Wow. Mm -hmm. And the agony of somebody you actually love and actually spend time with, but you withhold that from them, mm -hmm. and then they're taken away from you. Mm -hmm. Seeing that really put something on somebody's spirit and in somebody's heart that, no, I can't wait. Yeah. So that really places something on somebody. So we always get that feedback, particularly from that piece. Well, I want to break away and talk to you, Corey, about your piece. We want to see you do what you do. Y'all want to see him act, right? Yeah. All right. We'll be right back. Stay close. Corey Shelton, monologue on the Lonnie Hunter. Evening, fellas. My name is Sergeant Rashid Carpenter. And you two, you two are? Good to meet you, good to meet you, good to meet you. You know that, uh, that donut that you got there sure does look good. You mind if I, uh, mind if I join you boys? No, no, well, no, no, well, we'll just, well, what's your hurry? I mean, no, no, just, just, just hold on a second. I mean, it's not going to take that long. I mean, how long could it take to eat the donut? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to bite you. I'm just going to bite the donut. Yeah, just sit back down. Have a seat. We're just going to have a conversation. That's good. Hey, uh, waitress, could you please get me a, uh, a glazed donut and uh, a large cup of coffee? Black. Hey, you two boys, you, you work the, the Greenboro Heights district, right? You, you, you two patrol them? You, you, you patrol there, right? Yes. I, I, I thought you looked familiar. Tell me this. Did you happen to work last night, the evening shift? You, you did. Okay. And did you happen to pull over a 2005... Uh, what was it? It was a 2005 Chevy Camaro. The uh, driver, he was a, uh, a, a black teenager. You did. And, and what, what, what was it for? Oh, he ran the stop sign. <clears throat> Actually, it was failure to signal. I beg your pardon, no, I am not just another activist on the force. I'm a brother on the force. And that kid that you pulled over last night was my brother. And no, I'm not just mad because it was my brother that you pulled over. I'm mad because I think that you two rousted my brother. And please, don't you dare, don't you dare give me that line that he fit the description of a carjacker that was in the area. Because I am familiar with each and every single carjacking bulletin in this district. And my brother does not even remotely resemble any one of those suspects. No, sir, that will not cut it. <laughs> so, so basically, what you did is, the bottom line is you pulled my brother over because he was a black kid driving in what? The wrong section of town? Almost as if as though uh, 
black kids can't drive in what, white neighborhoods? No, 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 he didn't have to say it, son. I said it for him. And you know what, as a matter of fact, officer, you can actually sit this one out because it seems like your partner over here is the one that has the mouthpiece. So I'm going to address you. Speaking of mouth, you, you mentioned something about my brother mouthing off. Of course he mouthed off to you. You accused him of something that he did not do. Anybody is going to mouth off to you if you try and blame them for something that they're not responsible for. <laughs> so, okay. So let's say he did mouth off. Let's say he did mouth off, right? So let me ask you this. Is that the reason why you made him get out of his car? And is that the reason why you made him lay down on the ground and cuffed him? Is that the reason why you jammed his face into his own car? And do not Feed me that line that, oh, I would have let him go if we known that he was a cop's brother. So what does that mean? What does that mean? That you only bully the black kids whose families aren't on the force? No, no. The bottom line is you pulled my brother over because he was black. And no, I cannot prove that right now but you had better believe that I will be filing a complaint and I will be conducting a thorough investigation. Now get out of my sight. Except, 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 except you, officer. He can go, but you need to stay. Tell me this, how long have you been a cop? So not long. And what makes you even want to be a cop? I mean, it's a very, very dangerous job. You put your life on the line every single day and you barely even get half the credit for it. So what makes you, what makes you want to be a cop? Hmm. To catch the bad guys, huh? Well, Doc, that's a really, really good reason to become a cop. It's only one problem. Your partner over there, he's one of the bad guys. <laughs> That was great, man. That was unbelievable. Thank you, sir. When, when we watched you do it, we wondered, did you write it? Or where, where does something like that come from? <laughs> so I don't think you're really going to believe where this came from, right? So where did it come from? That was a very serious monologue, yeah, right? Man. <clears throat> so I actually got that monologue, believe it or not, from, y'all remember Steve Urkel? Family Matters? <laughs> I got that monologue from Family Matters. It was, a, it was like one of the few uh, episodes that they did that was serious. And Somebody did what you did on Family Matters? They did. Was it Urkel? It was not, it was. Oh. It, <laughs> I was like, what all kind of research? <laughs> No, that's but yeah, good. that's exactly where I got it from. It was like one of those serious, I think it was Carl, Carl Winslow. And I, you know, modified it so that it was appropriate. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly but where I got But that speaks from. to your mind as an actor, man, to be able to look at a, a, a show like that and pull that out where everybody else is really paying attention to Urkel or they're, they're paying attention to the comic relief. Mm -hmm. For you to sit there and pull that out as a monologue and make it what you made it, that's the mind of an actor. Thank you very absolutely, much. Absolutely, absolutely. Show your love for Corey Taylor. And then it's relevant to what we're going through now. Say it again. And then I think it's, I feel like it's relevant to, you know, the, the racial climate that Absolutely. we're going through now. And like, that was actually almost probably 30 years ago and maybe 25. But. That's what made me think you wrote it because it was so relevant mm -hmm. to today. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's almost impossible, impossible to believe that 30 years ago they were talking about that stuff and it was just so far-fetched. Yeah. Now it's right in your face, and it's almost every week that we hear stories Equally like that. Equally as relevant. Yeah. Wow. Kara, your story that you're about to um, give us, 
is from who? It's from one of my favorite female African-American playwrights who I admire greatly. It's from Katori Hall. It's a play called The Mountaintop, and it's about the night before Martin Luther King is about to get assassinated. Um, the character, her name is Kame. She is an angel in the form of a maid, and she's sent to the Lorraine Hotel to prepare Martin Luther King for what's about to happen to him. So it's like a surreal drama. So she's there to essentially get him ready yeah. for what is to come. Let's get into it. Gary Shelton, here in the line of Hi, Gary. Are you perfect? <laughs> then why should I be? Honey, I've robbed. I've lied. I've cheated. I've failed. I've cursed. But what I'm most ashamed of is I've hated. Hated myself. Sacrificed my flesh so that others might feel whole again. I thought it was my duty. All I had to offer this world. What else is a poor black woman, the mule of the whole world, here for? Last night, in the back of the alley, I breathed my last breath. A man clasped his hands like a necklace around my throat. I stared up into his big blue eyes, and I saw everything that this world had put him through. Like the time he saw his father hang a man. The time he saw his mother raped. I felt so, so sorry for him. I saw everything that this world had done to him. And I still couldn't forgive him. I hated him. Stealing my breath. When I crossed over to the other side, God, oh God, she is more gorgeous than me. She got skin the color of midnight and her eyes, they shine brighter than the stars and her hair, oh, just you wait until you see her hair. God was just standing there. She, she was standing there looking at me. with this look on her face. And I know she was so disappointed in me. I just fell at her feet, just crying and weeping, begging her not to throw me down. All that sinning, all that grime on my soul, all that hatred in my heart. But then I looked up and I saw that she was smiling down on me. She opened her mouth to speak and silence came out. But I could hear her loud and clear. She said, I got a special task for you. And if you complete it, all your sins will be washed away. I opened up my file and I 
I saw my task was you. <laughs> now what can little old me give the big old you? <laughs> I thought you was gonna be perfect. Well, you ain't. <laughs> but then again, you are. You got the biggest heart I done ever known. You got the strength to love those who can never love you back. If I had just a fraction of the love that you have for this here world, then maybe, just maybe, I can become half the angel that you already are. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, Kara Shelton in a whole, n you know, to see you sit here like this and then to transform into what we just saw. Tell us about the process of becoming who that person is, because if it's not you, how do you become that to make it believable? You know, the hardest part was when I actually saw that play, um, I think it was my 30s, well, I'm not going to say how old I am. A few years ago. A few years ago. Yeah. All right. I saw it on Broadway, and Angela Bassett was playing that role. So the hardest part for me was taking that out of my mind, because, you know, Angela Bassett is Angela Bassett, and trying to make it my own. So I had to, and she's not, she's not real. She's an angel in human form. So it was me figuring out what she was trying to say. And the thing that I love about um, Katori Halls, when she writes, she writes so many layers. She writes, she writes so much with so little. So she's saying so much. So I had to think of what the character is trying to say, who she's speaking to. She's speaking, speaking to Martin Luther King and what she's trying to do. She's trying to get this man ready for his death wow. and understand what that is and what that means, who he is and what his death will mean. So in that short little piece, she's trying to help him understand that he's not perfect, but he's so great and there's so much to him. And there's so much piled in it that I just had to create the character of an imperfect person speaking to another imperfect person but they're both angels in their own way. Good. Mm -hmm. So Good. I was trying to pile all that into that. And one of the things that I like about you is you're an actor, of course, but you also write. And most of the stuff yeah. that I've seen on stage uh, that you were in, that you have written. Yeah. Uh, what is that process like? Can you write for yourself, or do you have to write always for somebody else to speak these words? No, I actually write um, for myself as well. One of the things that I've always written, I've written since like middle school. I would write like little short stories and little poems and things like that. But I started writing more for myself because, you know, as an actor, you don't always get every role you want to get. So it's very important to be a creator if you're able to, to create yeah. roles that you want to see. If you want to be in a role, create a role. Um, so I, all, I use my ability to write to start creating roles. So I, um, I began writing short plays, full-length plays, and I'm actually working on a one-act play now. So um, for me, the process has always been something very natural. I've been writing forever. So it's something that I've, I love. I love acting, but I really have a passion for writing just as much as acting. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. Kara Shelton. Yeah. 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 And before we get into what you're going to do for us, Josh, I just want to say that you took a, a leap of faith mm -hmm. and left your comfort zone mm -hmm. and moved to L.A. Yeah. Um, now, Josh and I are friends, so we talk all the time about what that process was like for you and what the downfall, what the up, up, upswing, all of that. Mm. Uh, but you ended up on a show called All American yes. with Tay Diggs. Yes. And uh, yeah, y'all remember that? Yeah. And you played a gangster. Yeah. yeah. Now, as your boy, yeah. I'm watching you. I'm like, that ain't you. <laughs> <laughs> but you did it, man, and you, and you made me believe it. Talk to us about what that journey looks like when you abandon your comfort zone and go out because this is what you know God has called you to do. Woo. Woo. It's a lot, right? Yeah, it is. Um, it's a... Uh, um, when I first got to California, I, went, I had to find a church. You know, I said, if I'm going to be out here, I need to find a church 
where I can, uh, while I'm out here on this journey, I just need to touch base. That's major. So um, I went to this uh, one church, and uh, the message for the uh, Sunday was, um, um, it was, it was about faith. It was about having an undenying faith, having an a, a arrogant faith, having a, a faith that can't be shaken. And um, the way he was bringing the message to me, it was just like, wow, like, if I can just have that kind of faith and just block out everything else, then I'm going to be okay. And um, every time I would go through something or it would look bad or I'd call my mom and dad, like, look, <laughs> I got about three more months and I'm coming home and give me a Walmart application because right, I don't... Right, right. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, because um, it was tough. Um, and, you know, God blessed me uh, with that opportunity. Um, but you said something that's really big, and you just kept talking over it. But I want to just stop for a minute and talk about the type of faith you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Arrogant faith. You don't hear people use those two words together a whole lot because arrogancy has a certain negative connotation to it. Mm -hmm. But when you put it on top of faith, man, that's a, that's a faith that says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And I got to say, Doc, watching you on the show, and uh, I can only imagine what we're about to see you do. Um, but when, I t when you talk about arrogant faith, all men, all women that have been called to do whatever they've been called to do, unless you go at it arrogantly, like you are the one that's been called to do this, it is very easy to be thrown off your square. And you said it. There were a couple of times when you were like, I'm going to get me a Walmart application and just keep moving. But your arrogant faith mm. wouldn't let you step off and away from what God has called you to do. Tell us about your piece you're about to do. So this piece is from uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, with one of my favorite actors of all time. So. This piece is from the movie Great Debaters and my favorite actor of all time, Denzel Washington. You about to tackle Denzel? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. All right, let's do it. Joshua Worlds right now on the Lonnie Hunter Variety Show. <laughs> Take the meanest. Most restless again. Strip him of his clothes in front of the male, the female, and the infants. Tar and feather him. Tie each leg to a horse facing the opposite direction. Set him on fire and beat each horse until they rip him apart. In front of the male, the female, and the infants. Bull whip and beat the remaining males within an inch of their life. Do not kill them, but put the fear of God in them so that they will be useful for future breeding. Willie Lynch, show of hands. Anyone know who Willie Lynch is? Willie Lynch was a vicious slave owner from the West Indies. You see, the slave masters in the Virginia colonies were having problems with their slaves, so they sent for Mr. Lynch so that he can teach them his methods. The word lynching comes from his last name. His methods were very simple but diabolical. Keep the slave physically strong, psychologically weaken the mind depending on the slave master. Keep the body, take the mind. I and any other professor here on this campus is here to help you find and take back your righteous mind. Because obviously, you have lost it, Mr. Lowe. And that is all you need to know about me. Class is missed. Wow. wow. All right, we are back, family, and uh, Josh, that thing was powerful in 30 seconds. I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know you was gonna get up here and cuss us all out and then leave. <laughs> Dog, but that thing is powerful and I gotta be honest, when it started, I was startled. <laughs> the way it started, it was like, Lord, the Lonnie Hunter Show has seen its last episode. <laughs> But that's almost got the kind of effect you want to have to just kind of grab people mm -hmm. and make them listen to how this thing is going to turn out. Mm -hmm. 
Why was it was it that short when Denzel did it? Yeah, that's actually the end of the scene. Um, it was a scene with uh, the character uh, William Lowe, and um, he was kind of challenging Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington was the instructor of the debate team, so he was kind of challenging uh, Denzel Washington. You know, he was, you know, sticking his chest out, Mr. Know It All, and that was Denzel Washington's way of checking him. Got it. Got it. Well, I am proud of all three of you all. I can't wait to see what the future has. Eyes have not seen. And it's, it's so amazing to me that this kind of talent has yet to even be tapped into from a national level. Can you imagine when that door opens for them, what we are about to see, what we are about to view? Yeah, come on, please, ma'am, please, sir. Help me congratulate these three actors, Corey Shelton, Kara Shelton, and Joshua World. Yeah. It is the Lottie Hunter Variety Show. Stay close for a whole lot more. We love you for real. Impact Television.